I asked the panelists if they would be willing to introduce themselves with a little bit of their background story, um, a few tips, and um, give them about five to ten minutes each to talk, and then we'll start with your questions that you have to ask the panelists. So whoever wants to go first. I'm going to go first. Hi, I'm Andy Carroll. I'm with uh, Eric Mowart and Associates. We're a full service uh, advertising agency based in Syracuse, but we do have uh, six other locations, uh, four in upstate New York, and then Atlanta, Charlotte, and Cincinnati. Um, my background, I've been at uh, Eric Moore for 10 years. Uh, prior to that, I was in the telecommunications industry where I was a, a manager of designers and coordinators for telecommunication systems. Um, ended up getting laid off twice by a company called Worldcom. Um, <laughs> I remember that, it was during the uh, dot bomb era, so that kind of happened. Um, I had actually not finished my degree at Syracuse. Um, I had run out of money when I was a senior. So at that point I went back to school and actually interned uh, at Eric Moore, and then about six months later the person had left. Um, so I'm responsible for most of our recruiting. Um, Basically, uh, I am a generalist, what does that mean? I pretty much do anything related to human resources, so it's 401ks, uh, but a good chunk of my time uh, is dedicated to recruiting and looking at resumes, uh, giving feedback on resumes, talking to students on campus. I'm usually here a couple, three times a year for recruiting events and other universities. Um, I'd say one of the biggest things that, you know, tips for your resume is obvious ones like spelling and grammar. Uh, I've seen, seen a student spell the name of a university incorrectly. Um, they had been studying abroad for another university and they spelled it wrong. Because I looked at it and you're kind of like, geez, that's an odd spelling. I don't know what that is. Um, <clears throat> cover letters, uh, I, I, I like them a little shorter than a lot of people do. Uh, a couple, three paragraphs. Um, I see cover letters that are filled up the whole thing, that in my opinion, and they're basically rehashing what exactly is on the resume, which um, I'll tell you right now, recruiters don't spend 15 minutes reading your cover letter or 15 minutes reading your resume, sadly. Um, it's probably a minute, and I, and I might be kind. Um, I sat with uh, one of our uh, people that we were hiring at an entry level position, basically sat at my laptop. We scrolled through the resumes, and she's uh, you know she's 26, so she recently graduated. And she's like, "This is the time you spend on resumes." I'm like, well, I can tell what I'm looking for. You know, after a while, recruiters know what they're looking for, um, and if it's hard to read, uh, if it's the font's too small, um, you get to a certain age and reading the medicine bottles. I'm not at that age where I need readers. Um, if you have font that's real tiny. It's going to be a struggle sometimes, and you got to keep that in mind. You're like, hey, I want to get all this stuff in. Um, you know, formatting I think is, is important. I'm, I'm a fan of telling you where where you worked and bullets, bullet lists, not big chunks of copy because, again, I'll get 150 to 200 resumes for a public relations uh, person. I don't have the time to sit through that. Um, I mean, I'm sure Syracuse University does the same thing. I know they have a whole online thing. Um, they're time consuming, but if you want the job, you gotta do it. And make sure you do it well, because I see where people will copy and paste a resume in, and you can tell they just did it, and they didn't go back to look and see what it actually looks like. Um, some of it's systems, you know, some of the HTML stuff that happens inside of a, a web page will screw up your fonts and stuff, correct them. It shows attention to detail. Um, and if you know the person you're sending it to, look them up. Uh, spell the name right. <laughs> I kid. My last name is Carolyn. I get it with a Y. I get it with an E on the end. Um, it just shows attention to detail. Um, the other main thing that I tell people is use your network. Um, what does that mean? These guys, career services, uh, alumni group, once you graduate, use them. Uh, I tell people, recent grads too, all right, write down everybody in your family, find out where they work. Um, your neighbors, uh, you know, 
your, your next, across the street, I know the guy works for Welch Allen out in Skinny Atlas. Um, <clears throat> I would use that as a contact um, where your neighbors work. Uh, usually, most times you get jobs. I hired about 35% of all of our new hires are come from employee referrals, which, again, that's using your network. Um, if you don't have a strong network, um, wherever you're going, you know, utilize the, the school. They like to see you, just not every single day. <laughs> so, that's my two cents for now. Okay, I'll go next. Uh, Brian Webb. I'm a, uh, I started my career in the finance and accounting world and conducted job search uh, first right out of school in uh, Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, a year later, I moved to Boston, and then four years after that, I moved back here to Syracuse. So, uh, conducted job you know, searches in different different areas and I've been on the side obviously uh, as a uh, producer of a resume and kind of know uh, what goes into that. There's a lot of time that goes into creating that document and as Andy said, there's not a whole lot of time that gets spent on the other side reviewing it. So it's not necessarily an even distribution there. Uh, but nine years ago I began my career as a recruiter, uh, also known as a headhunter by some. Uh, but uh, I, I specialize primarily in the finance and accounting world uh, here in central New York. We do have uh, some clients outside of the, the area as well, but primarily the work I do is kind of within an hour and a half radius of Syracuse. Uh, I've looked at, uh, you know, I probably look at 30 resumes a day, and doing this for, for nine years, it's probably safe to say I've looked at over 50,000 resumes. If you kind of crush the numbers, which I did yesterday, <laughs> I was kind of, uh, kind of amazed by that. Um, and I probably spend, at this point, you know, maybe uh, 20 to 30 seconds per resume. If it's good, maybe a little bit longer, but sometimes it's less than that. Um, I would say some of the big things uh, that I look at uh, are certainly format. Uh, I like to see a simple format, not a lot of special um, text boxes or things like that. I prefer using a Word document. A lot of times when I look at, or when I receive a resume, I'll make some changes to it before I ultimately send it on to our clients. So I like to have the ability to, to edit that. Uh, PDFs are also good, I think. It's easy to preserve the formatting when you use a PDF, but in my case, I'm going to convert that to Word anyway. So I typically ask people for their Word copy anyways. I think you know if I if I were you, I'd have one of each, and uh, depending on where you're sending it, a lot of resumes are submitted online these days as attachments. Uh, and use the PDF in that case. That way, the formatting will be preserved, and you can be more assured that it will get through to the the reader in the right format. If you do convert it to a PDF from a Word, look at it and make sure it's legible because a lot of times I'll see it get converted in the font that you use, you use to the Word doc. It's not a clean copy. Um, if you use it a little fancier, it'll, it'll be harder to read. And it's, it's, not, I think it's not your fault, but Adobe just does it that way. And, you, know, you don't want to reflect like you didn't take the time. Yeah, a lot of times that's your, that's your first and only chance. Yeah. So. Um, in terms of length, uh, two pages should be the most you ever need. Uh, there's no reason it should go beyond that. I mean, there's people who, you know, once you're later on in your career, you certainly would like to add more, but there's a, you can condense that uh, later information down. Um, I saw somewhere that to do a word count, which kind of makes sense. Uh, looks, and I looked at a few that looked good and some that looked too crowded. It looked like right around 700 words is is the max. If you do more than that, then it's just too much text and. You know, your eyes just can't process that much, and sometimes you're just not in the mood and you won't read it. Yeah. Uh, other things, you know, basic stuff, format-wise, uh, reverse chronological order, so start at the top with your most recent experience, um, with your most recent job, then work backwards from there. So you want a company name. I like to see usually a quick sentence or phrase about what that company does, so you can get a feel for their size and their industry. Um, and then from there, um, you're, you're your title and the dates. Uh, I see a lot of resumes sometimes without dates, and to me that looks like you're trying to hide something. So uh, that's a, that's information that needs to be on there. I don't see a lot of need for things like objectives or executive summaries. Uh, a lot of times that's fluff that could otherwise be used. That space could otherwise be used with uh, with real details, facts, accomplishments, things that set you apart. And you know, speaking to that, I think a lot of people get in the in the habit of using their resume and it looks a lot like a job description or a condensed um, group of job description. And I think 
you need to include your responsibilities and things that you've done, but you also need to include your specific accomplishments and things that set you apart in those roles. Um, so that it's not just reading as a list of what you, what you did, but also what you contributed, what set you apart, and what you added to the, to the organization. Things like that are usually things that saved either time or money. Um, so you can find, no matter what your role is, you can find ways that you, know, you, uh, you can save the organization either time or money. Um, I think that's it. I mean, there's some general phrases that I kind of get tired of seeing. Things like uh, outstanding communication skills or proficient in Excel. Everyone says that. And then when you test them in Excel, they're not proficient in Excel. So just save that step and just list, you know, if it's technical skills, you know, list those things, you know, uh, Microsoft Excel and, and the volume maybe on you know, 2010 or whatever the most recent one is. Um, I think that pretty much does it for me. I'd be happy to take any questions after we're done with the introductions. Thank you. Okay, I'm Kathy Barony. I've been in human resources as I look around the room probably twice as long as everybody's been alive. It's been decades, but there's an advantage to age a big advantage and with age comes experience if you use that that time wisely. I have my own business. I do human resources consulting and this is my 12th year being a business for myself and I absolutely love it. I was in the corporate world prior to that. I've done my life, my professional life a little bit backwards because the first thing I did was get my PHR certification which is a certification in human resources kind of like a CPA and then I got my master's certificate at Cornell and then I got my bachelor's degree 10 years ago. So it's, it's been very interesting. As far as number of resumes, I haven't run the numbers like Brian has, but I've been reviewing them for uh, 30 years, at least 30 years. So I'm sure it's in the, in the thousands also. One of the things, everything these guys have said is, is right on. There's, there's not, absolutely not anything that I disagree with. I have a couple of things to add to it, but before I do, I want to ask you guys a question. What's a resume for? Anybody want to make a guess? <laughs> to introduce yourself. Absolutely. Remember that. It's to introduce yourself. It's not to tell your story. The interview is to tell your story. So the resume needs to be brief, as these folks have said. We were asked to talk about three common mistakes that we see on resumes. One of the things that I see on resumes is too many eyes. Too many eyes. I did this. I did this. I did this. Make sure you proof that resume and you take out the eyes. You're part of a team wherever you work. You know, you're not a house alone. So look for too many eyes in every sentence starting with an eye in your resume. And I hope there's no English majors in this room. Don't have an English major, write your resume. Either write it yourself, use the help of career services. Why do I say that? Why do I say don't have an English major? Write your resume. If I guess? The reason being is English majors are really great at English. What do they know about writing a resume for an employer? All of us up here, I'm sure you'll all agree, we review resumes for content, not for proper English, other than spelling. Don't misspell things. It can make or break it. I'm one of those that if I see a spelling error, the resume goes in the no pile. Why would that be? Why would one little spelling error make a difference? I had a VP of HR tell me this once, and I'm repeating it, because I can because I can find somebody that's got their resume perfect. So it can eliminate you. One little tiny error can eliminate you. The other big mistake I see people make is they don't write the resume for the people that might be reading it. In many cases, the first pass is an Andy, or a Brian, or a Tracy. But also in many cases, because you don't know, it could be an administrative assistant, a secretary, who is trained to review resumes. So write your resume. My point is, is write your resume in simple language. Write it for the person to gather information with. Remember that introduction. So I think the mistakes I see is that people don't do that. They try to get really fancy with it. What makes a resume stand out? We were asked to ask you about that or talk to you about that. Um, simplicity, neat and clean, and that's been mentioned before. It needs to be pleasing to look at. Bulleted points, as Andy said, it's, it's the way to go with bulleted points. Also, something that shows who you are. I don't mean put your marital status on there. I don't mean put your personal hobbies. But what have you done that's going to bring things to the table? Have you volunteered? Have you done community service? Have you done things that show that you are acknowledged in your field? Um, 
it could, again, could be part of a uh, leadership role in a Girl Scout, Boy Scout, Big Brother, Big Sister. So show who you are in your resume. It's really important these days. Lastly, a couple of tips that, that I want to give out to folks is don't give the person that's reading your resume any reason to exclude you. We tend to make our resumes a personal statement of us, and I've just said show who you are, but make sure that it's fairly generic. Don't ever put your religious affiliations on there. Don't ever put your political affiliations on there. And I'm not saying people are going to be discriminatory, but many will be. You know, so by putting something personal like that on there, they're going to look at that and say, nope, and they're going to push it aside before they look at your qualifications. So don't give a reason. Yes? What about nationality? Nationality doesn't go on your resume. It doesn't, doesn't belong. Any personal information, and everybody speak in and, and disagree with me if, if you do. Anything personal, what goes on your resume is a statement about the type of employee you're going to be. That's what I mean when I'm saying who you are. The, the uh, nationality yeah. may come into play when you're applying somewhere. Right. It may, it's a voluntary uh, right. ask. They right. can ask it, Absolutely. but that, that's where it would usually go. Yeah. Another really important thing, two quick last things, is don't ever lie on your resume. Don't ever lie on your resume. People have done that at all age groups. It just, if your employer finds out, number one, technically they can fire you for it. But number two, what's that tell about your credibility? And I think lastly is, and I know this is an electronic age, and I'd be real interested to see if everybody agrees with me. When you go to a, re a re uh, interview, bring a hard copy. Bring a hard copy. If the person who's, who's going to interview you has their screen up and it goes down, they don't have anything. Hard copy never goes down. So bring that with you just in case. That's it for me. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Tracy Tillapa. I'm a career consultant here in Career Services, and I recognize some of you, so I'm glad you've come to visit us. Uh, we're located at 235 Shine. Um, I've been with Career Services for almost three years, which is kind of hard to believe. Um, and before I worked in Career Services, I worked as a recruiter. And I actually worked with Brian, but I recruited for IT and engineering positions, um, so I bring a little bit of a different viewpoint as well. Um, before I worked in IT and engineering, I did a little bit in the medical field, and also I did some things with um, food service industry. So I have a little bit of a varied background. And one of the interesting things um, when I work with students is I try to think as a recruiter would think and try to recall what I thought as a recruiter as well. Um, so oftentimes I'll give feedback based on how I would look at it if I was a recruiter and you were sending me this email among 200 other applications. So helping you to see how you stand out. Um, one of the things to mention and just that I have the um, internal knowledge here at SU knowing that so many of you come to study here from different countries and in different countries there are different um, standards for your resume. So when Kathy mentions religious affiliation, um, your marital status, um, different things like that, that might be something that's common for you to see in a different country. But in the United States, we like to see resumes that just show your qualifications for the position. And in our understanding, a lot of times that doesn't mean have anything to do with maybe your religious practice. So that's why we say to get rid of that on the resume. Um, I think we see a lot of common things in career services, again, knowing that a lot of you have um, come from different countries. We always emphasize switching to the American style resume, which means removing any of that personal information. I know when I worked as a recruiter, um, we would get pictures on the resumes. One time I believe I learned somebody's cat's names. Um, <laughs> which really has no bearing to how that person could do the job, but I'm glad Fluffy is, you know, enjoying his stay with you. Um, also, converting your GPA can be difficult sometimes. Um, we emphasize that, and I know students that come from different countries, maybe their GPA was 70% um, or something like that. So coming to see us and learning, how does that translate? Um, if Brian were to see 70%, he would assume you didn't do very well based on the U.S. standards. So knowing that is very important. Um, one of the things that I think we'll continue to emphasize is you really have to know the industry that you're applying to. Um, so far, we've mentioned really simple formats and um, having resumes that are really plain. But if any of you are going into the creative field, then we would encourage you to show that creativity on your resume as you're representing yourself. Um, 
But don't go too crazy. But don't go too crazy. We do yeah, hear. You've got to read it. <laughs> right, right. You still have to be able to show your content well. Um, one of the things that I also commonly see in career services when I look over resumes is telling about the organization or company or disclosing the project that you worked on instead of describing what you did on that project. So one thing you need to do is describe the project in terms of here's how I contributed and accomplished that project, similar to what Brian mentioned. Talk, talk to us about your accomplishments, talk about, to us about what you did, not that you know, Walt Disney World was a great place to work and it's a theme park located in Florida. So keep that in mind that you want to showcase that. Um, I know as well that we're always um, encouraging a one-page resume at this point. You do want to try to do that and we work with you on formatting. Um, we like to have you use bullet points. As you can hear from our audience, they, or from our panel, they don't spend a lot of time reading your resume. So you need to really separate your thoughts with those bullet points. And I don't know if this is true, you, you can all answer, but I did hear that recruiters tend to look at the top half of the resume first, and then they tend to look at those bottom three lines on the resume. So I encourage students to always change the order of your information based on the position that you would apply to. And you absolutely should be tailoring your information to the job description itself. I think one of the most important things to do is to look at each job description separately and take a highlighter to it. I can do this, I've done this before, I've done all these things, and highlight all of those things that you've done. And then you need to go back to your resume and say, well, I've done this, is it on the resume? Because the recruiters only have the information that they're, you're sending them. They don't know you in any other way. So you need to make sure you're spelling it out clearly for them that you can do the position. Did I answer all the questions? <laughs> I think so, I think everyone did a good job. Um, if you guys are all ready, I'd like to open it up for some questions. Just one raise the, your hand. One of the things I wanted to add to sure. something that was said about the, the nationality and putting that on there, Tracy, you said about being coming from different countries. We have laws here. Some of them are pretty silly, but we have laws <coughs> um, with regard to human rights and affirmative action on a federal level. And one of the reasons we highly suggest people don't put anything about nationality on their resumes is because employers can be accused of using that against you. And notice I said be accused of. So if there's no nationality on the resume, you've got a clean slate. Everybody's on the same plane. Everybody's on the same plane with that. And that's why it's important, because we've got some little technicalities here. But it was a good point. When Tracy, the other thing you said, Tracy, that I'll address, is you mentioned about reading the front, the top, and then the bottom line. we got to have some way to cut down the time. you got to have. I remember in my career, the most resumes I ever received from an opening was 505 resumes for one opening. And that's, that's unusual. That's extremely unusual. But you, I think you mentioned 150 you get is not unusual. You've got to have a way to, to get through those. So we, we do need to take short cuts. Just picking up on that point, I wonder if you could talk about how you get down from 500 and maybe everybody's got the same. Yes, no, maybe. Okay. The no's would be the ones that you go through and number one, it might look a mess or that you can totally tell by looking at it in 30 seconds that that person has no experience in the field that you're looking for. That goes in the no. I don't know about the other folks, but with myself, between the yeses and the maybes, I know in my head before I start reviewing resumes. And I don't review resumes for my own company. I do it for clients which, like the recruiters, is probably is, is very scary because you're passing judgment on somebody. So I have, I'm very clear in my head what I'm looking for. If I find somebody that's got it, they go in the yes pile. If I find somebody that might have it, they go in the maybe pile. If I don't get enough people from the yes pile to satisfy my client's needs, and I was the same way when I was an HR director, then I'll go to the maybe pile. So it's, it's going through it quickly, knowing what you're looking for, and saying this one has it, this one doesn't, this one definitely doesn't. Any other things to add to that? Yeah, I think you have your automatic no's, you know, spelling mistakes. Right. I've, I've received cover, cover letters with somebody else's name on it. Yes. You know, address to somebody else. Good point. Uh, those things are automatic no's. Uh, and then you have people who clearly just know what they're looking for. Just a very drastic career change, you know, a, a waitress to a CFO or something like that. Um, Sadly, so, you get, in my case, I get a lot of garbage. 
Yes, you do. Um, you know, you're like, it's, I need a, a creative director in my Charlotte office with eight, ten years of experience in an advertising agency or marketing, and I'm getting someone who works at Home Depot, which is fine. You know, they're in the marketing department, but they're not, they don't have a portfolio, they're not a creative, so boom, gone. Um, and there's a lot of that. We all see that. And I think, too, for IT and engineering, um, if you're in those fields, making sure that if it's software development with Java, and you've done that, it needs to be on the resume, having the technical skills section, but also including any of the technologies in the positions or projects that you've done as well. I actually learned something from the presentation that Elena sent us with uh, the, uh, is it Tag Crowd? Yeah. Is that the, the name of the yeah. website? There's a great website called tagcrowd.com, I think it's called. And mm -hmm. What you do is you just copy and paste the job description that you're looking at into that, into a text box, and it creates um, tags, a little cloud of tags, with the most, most commonly used words. Do that on everything you apply for, and make sure all those words are on your resume, and that'll just, that'll give you a much better chance. What was that website called? Tag Crowd. Internships today are way different than they were 20 years ago. Um, I know that when we hire somebody, they usually had at least three or four internships uh, in, in the field. Um, I might have that a little bit of a luxury because we're one of the few agencies left in this area. But um, you know, having those experiences is, is, is key, uh, even if it's volunteer work. A lot of students, they're trying to get an internship and they're a marketing person, that's my world. Uh, go volunteer at whatever charity is near and dear to your heart. At least you're, you can put it down as an internship. You, you know, they're going to take volunteers. They will take volunteers. That will get you some experience. Um, and it's got to be a nonprofit agency yeah. to be a volunteer. Yeah. You can't go to a private or a public employer to volunteer. But you can go to a nonprofit. And if you don't have experience, then find someone who can champion for you. I think it was, what did you mention, Brian? Uh, networking? Somebody like mentioned yeah, yeah. networking. Find someone who knows you and can speak to your integrity and your, your, your intelligence and your abilities. Because that person can get you an introduction where a blind resume can't. Building that network can be a challenge. Um, another way to do it possibly is through temp work. Um, and as you know, I work for an agency that also does temporary work. I know we, we work with a lot of entry level people uh, looking to get some experience. And it may not be necessarily related to the field that you're in, but it develops your professional network, it develops some skills that you can show, showcase on your resume, and it just, it'll give you a little bit more of that real world experience that fills out your resume. It could get you a foot in the door at that organization that you're tempting at. Um, oftentimes, I'm just going to hurt attempts there and like, man, they're really good. We want to. Yeah, things change very quickly where. You know, you start in, there's been a lot of people who start a job one day and then you know, a few weeks later somebody leaves and the organization is scrambling and you can kind of raise your hand and say, that's what I'm looking to do. And if, you, if you're doing a good job in your role, a lot of times you're already in the door, you have that in. Uh, so that's what look and they'll look at you first rather than go through the recruiting of looking at resumes and calling you people. The other thing that we hear in IT and engineering as well is, and especially from a company like Microsoft, we met with recruiters last year, and they really like to see you really passionate about what you'd like to do. So if there's any side projects that you're interested in doing, I know you're all busy with classes and group work and different things, but if there's side projects that you have started up building your own website or building your own mobile application shows that interest, and that is something you can put on the resume as well. Let's say, like, research work in school count as experience? Research? Absolutely. If you're working with a professor or a PhD student on research or doing your own research, you can also include that on the resume. Now, depending on what you'd like to do in the future will probably depend on how much
based on the resume you take to do that. If you're not looking to go into research, um, you want to think about what are the things that I'm doing in this research that is, that's informing me and preparing me for a position in industry. What? That professor is a good reference for you too, because he or she will be able to attest to the quality of your work, your work ethic. Uh, and on the point of references, just a quick note, references should not go on your resume. You don't even need to say at the bottom, references available upon request. You know, believe me, people will ask you if they want them. Uh, so save that line for something else, but um, you know, references are something that is typically provided later on. And make sure your references know that they are a reference. Uh, nothing worse than calling somebody to say, hey, I'm calling about uh, Joe Smith, and uh, put you down, he put you down as a reference, and you, you hear the little pause. Oh, yeah. Yeah, or they're like, how do I know them? And they're like, well, you know, they interned for you five years ago, and, you know, that's five years ago, and the person, you know, they need to be reminded. I, I've done that in my life, where I'm like, okay, hey, let you know, you might get a call. Suppose, like, suppose I worked in similar industry before, and then I now I'm looking for a job in like in different area. Would that help? Like, uh, can I say like this in uh, this area is similar to your job to your job, and then, like like I say something in my resume like it's similar. Should I do that? I think that's what a cover letter is for. If you've got transferable skills, because that's what I'm hearing from you, if I'm understanding correctly, is you did one thing, you're, you might be applying for something a little bit different. The cover letter, and keep it brief, I do agree with that. Nobody wants to read two paragraphs. Um, that in your cover letter, you can reference my resume shows this, your job asks for this. This is how I feel that it transfers over. Um, before we move on, I think there was a second part of your question asking about the coursework that you've done. Was that another part of the question? Besides research, you wanted to know if coursework should go on the resume? As no, that level. wasn't? Okay. Okay. Well, Okay. <laughs> As entry level, I believe yes. I think later on in your career, that information you can kind of drop that off. But particularly if it's very relevant to the job that you're applying for, coming you know fresh out of school, I think that's something you want to show that you've taken this class. Uh, but like I said, later on the experience will trump that. So yeah, I, I wouldn't put. I see people still putting their high school um, unless you were valedictorian. Right. I agree. I don't think I would. Because obviously you graduate high school if you went to college. So. Right, right. Um, yeah. But I still see it, and you just gobbled up four lines of space that right. you could put something else in there. And if you include your courses, don't include every course that you've taken here at SU or during your undergraduate programs. Pick out the most important courses that relate to the positions that you're applying to. Right. Beer drinking 101 is not one of them. We do have a beer and wine appreciation class. How far back is Because you, your experience, you know, is a couple of years, not necessarily a month. Um, how far, uh, how far back can we go? Especially coming out of the master's program and not coming out of the bachelor's program. How far, the question how was, far how far back with your experience can you go on your resume? I think it really depends. Yeah, experience or, or coursework? Well, for example, with education, I mean, I guess it will vary depending on the, the um, what you're applying for. But some of us may have worked before coming into our master's program. Some of us may have worked while we're doing our bachelor's. And that can take up a nice chunk of your of your of your resume, which if it's relevant, but keep it on there. Um, if you were, I mean, I just, I'll I'll tell some students like like well, I worked at the uh, CVS drugstore since I was a, a sophomore in high school, and you don't have any other experience. I'm like, well, you can put that on there. It just shows that you got work experience. You were you were working uh, every every summer. You came back and worked in the exact same place. That shows that you. Were, you know, our trusted employee, and, um, that will drop off once you start getting into your career. But if it's something that you've done, it's rel relevant, I would say. And you can always shorten it if, if you're, and I wouldn't compromise putting information on a resume just to keep it to one page. 
if it needs to be there, if it needs to be there, and that's the key. But you can always shorten work experience. I would never leave it off. It, I think that's faults of mine. I would never leave something totally off. And if, if different if it's, as you said, if it was in high school, you know, once you get older, you can leave it off. But you could even put something as simple down as work several part-time jobs in various areas while getting my bachelor's degree. What that's going to show, remember we said a resume introduces you, that's going to introduce you to the fact that you work while you're getting your degree. And the employer will ask you, well, what did you do? And when you fill out an employment application, because most places are going to make you fill out an employment application, they ask for all the jobs that you've had. So you'll have an opportunity to tell more about it then too. Thank you. Next question? Yeah. Uh, I'm someone who is looking for a technical job. Should I include uh, an experience which specifies the leadership skills that I was having? Is it uh, a good idea or not? Can you include what? Uh, uh, I, I am looking for a technical job. Yes. Uh, I had some work experience which showed that I have a good leadership skills. So should I include it in my resume? Okay. Uh, the question was, is applying to a technical job and wants to include maybe some leadership skills in a related industry on the resume. Should you include that, a leadership section? I think absolutely. Yeah. Anytime yeah. you've had leadership experiences, they should be on the resume. Yeah, there's so many organizations that hire not only for the role that you're applying for, but also they're looking at the night towards succession planning. Yes. And the fact that you would have some kind of leadership experience in your background would just would make you promotable in the future. So, absolutely. That's a, that's a good point. That's a very, very good point as far as when you, you don't know the organization and if you've got skills that are valuable skills, and I know I made a joke about the beer thing, that wouldn't necessarily be a valuable skill unless you were going to go open up a brewery or something, but leadership is always a valuable skill. And many organizations will, when they review resumes, they'll say, you asked the question about the yes pile and the maybe pile. Sometimes it'll help you get in the yes pile if you've got more. And I'll give you an example. This is not applicable to entry level, but it'll, it'll give you an example. Right now I'm recruiting for an opening for SNOE College in admissions, and it's going to be a management position. So we're not necessarily looking for management experience because we're willing to take somebody who can make it to that next level. But if I've got somebody who's got leadership experience on there, I'm going to go in my yes pile first before somebody who doesn't have a risk. Okay, um, academic careers. So I've been trying to build my academic career for the last five, six years, which means that it, I've not been, I don't have a corporate career or something that looks like anything corporate. I'm thinking at this point I may need to consider making the jump into the corporate world or into not on the non-academic track. How can I fit my what would I what I would call my academic career to look like that? Because even though I've all the programs and projects I've been involved in are related to the work that I'm doing, but it doesn't and my father told me that I should be wary of this because I would be perceived as not having work experience. How do I make that transition? On my resume. Go see her. <laughs> Go see Roseanne. <laughs> um, you know, we, I, I haven't worked a lot with this scenario, but I do remember when I worked at Professionals Incorporated, we did work with a few um, PhD, um, people that had earned their PhDs and, um, in IT, and I think it's important, whatever you can do to get that real world experience or to showcase those transferable skills. Um, so how have the programs and projects that you've done shown organizational skills or, you know, depending on what area you're looking into, the skills that would then translate into that setting in the industry. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, I think that's ideal, but mm -hmm. I mean, let's say I'm applying for a, a job that I have the skills for, but, you know, in, realistically, I feel like as an HR person, you would look at my thing and I automatically go in the no pile because I've not worked anywhere else but on a university campus for the last six years. Would you be applying in a corporation? 
Is that what you're saying? And what is your field? Are you in information technology? Yeah. I'm um, doing my master's in Pan African Studies. Uh, my bachelor's, but I do have more practical skills for my bachelor's where I was in media and communications. Mm -hmm. And I have some philosophy mixed up in that as well. So I, my, my master's degree doesn't really have that technical. I can illustrate where it would apply in terms of a niche, but that's if I get into an interview, not necessarily as I'm trying to get my foot in the door. I think the best thing that you could do is, is, is we all said, look at that job description. Look at the job description that you're applying for and focus on the keywords in that job description that you have. And change your resume if you have to, to, re to reflect that and highlight that. And an example might be, and, and this is the first example that comes to mind, even though it's not applicable to your field. I worked with a fellow one time who was um, human resources, part human resources and part safety. So what we did with his resume, when he applied for a safety job, we flipped things. We put safety on the top, those top couple lines you talked about. And we put HR down at the bottom. So we flipped where the reader's eye might read. But that aside, if that doesn't work for you, you can always find phrases, terms in that job description that you've got some experience with. And you can use those keywords somewhere in your resume or your cover letter. And I think this question is a little bit of a bigger question of how does it translate now and what types of careers in the industry would I be looking at? And that's right. something we can chat with you about right. as well. Sure. Um, because before you know where you're going, you can't do anything to the resume. So one of the other things that you might want to do is look at other PhDs. I'm assuming you're working toward a PhD? No, no. Master's degree. Master's degree. Master's degree. Master's degree. Master's degree. Master's degree. Um, but so looking at what have other people done that have that degree, what are they doing out in the industry? How did they get there? And is there any tips or advice they can give you that are looking to do the same thing? One of the ways you can do that too is go on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is like my best friend sometimes. You can do a search on LinkedIn. And let's say you were going to be looking for a job and you're, you said your, your um, degree was in what again? Your studies were in? My bachelor's. Bachelor's, yeah. Media and communications. Well, let's say you were going to be looking for a job in media and communications. You go on LinkedIn, you do an advanced search, and you search on those keywords, and you come up with people who have or have had those jobs, and you look at their career progression. Say, gee, this person did it this way, that would be a career path. LinkedIn is very valuable with, with educating yourself as to what gets people where they are. You might be able to find common skill sets too, like in accounting, you know, every accounting professional needs to know Excel, which is, you know, it's the tool that everybody uses. So if somebody were to look to break into the accounting field, just as an example, uh, they might be able to enroll in, a, in an Excel class and, and get a certificate to show that they've uh, passed an advanced Excel course. So that's just one, one thing that's not going to get them the job, but you start to build towards that, you, you kind of build those technical skills that you can, in addition to trying to, uh, correlate those, those skills that you have into that new position and create that tie. Yes, Rosie? Um, either from your current experience or from the companies that you deal with, for those of you who've worked in uh, recruiting firms, I wonder if you could talk about how the resume goes between HR people and hiring managers. What's the path of that like? Who are the decision makers and how the decisions get made about what to pass on to them? That's a good question. There's a, I think there's a, it varies by organization. Some HR professionals are more empowered to make that first choice. Other hiring managers like to say, send everything to me, I want to see it. A lot of times it depends on the internal dynamics of the company. Um, usually when I'm taking a job order and I'm learning about what the organization needs, I want to meet with the hiring manager and the HR professional, and they, depending on how strong their teamwork is internally, uh, they'll determine how it's going to work. Um, so there are there are many times where your information will not get to a hiring manager unless the HR person deems that you're a fit for it. If, well, if it's a company that is large enough to have HR, if it's not, who knows where it's going to go? Right. It could go in different places. Technology is changing that a little bit. I know that we've moved to an applicant tracking system mm -hmm. that, you know, the hiring manager gets everything. You know, we're kind of experimenting with that. I'm not sure they're liking it that much because I used to pre-screen 
a lot of stuff. And for me, I could tell uh, after a year or two of doing it, I'm like, all right, you've not worked at an advertising agency. No. <laughs> no. Uh, so there was a screen that used to go on more. So um, so we're, we're kind of experimenting. But yeah, every, everybody's different. They like, get real small. They really are. Everybody is but different. People who make the decisions generally are the hiring manager. I don't. I don't hire anybody, really. I mean, you know, unless it's someone that we're replacing at the front desk or something. Uh, the HR person doesn't make the decision. It's it's the hiring manager. And in some organizations, and I can speak for Casanova College because they've been a client of mine for a long time. Nobody gets hired in a management position in the president's approval, whether they report to him or not. Um, on the other hand, in an uh, entry level position, I agree. Manager that's going to do it. HR in most organizations doesn't do the hiring, especially in professions like you folks would be in with advanced degrees. Yeah, you do see applicant tracking systems with more and more of a role, and a lot of those they're designed to help the, the workflow uh, move through the organization more efficiently. Uh, so, a lot of times, you, I know I've seen the back end of some of those, it will give you kind of a, a matching percentage of this person's a 87% match to the keywords. That description. So again, that speaks to the importance of having those keywords. Uh, a lot of those things are happening. A lot of those things happen automatically through software, uh, not just the reader's eye. So make sure you have that information. So you'd recommend like tweaking your resume for each job that you apply to to try to get it to kind of uh, align exactly with those job descriptors? Yeah, have one uh, one core resume that you don't change or, you know, you change, I guess, periodically over time, but one and that you don't edit, and then, you know, save a version of it for each job. So, you know, use those keywords. You know, there's different things you may want to emphasize or highlight, move things in, uh, take things out. And sometimes each job will be the same as another job. I think what we mean is each job in a particular job category that might be close. Just be careful that if you send one electronically and then you bring that hard copy I talked about, they do the same. <laughs> I have seen people bring two different ones before. <laughs> Absolutely. I have a question. Who's practiced their, their resume? Like, with a friend to like talk about yourself? Because Kathy said it's a story. Uh, when I interview, uh, when I come up here in April, do the communications consortium and they probably 10 or 12 students and I'll give them a, and I got a half hour for each so I got to give them a quick blurb and then I pretty much turn it over to them and say well that's your resume you wrote it I hope um, <laughs> it's your story so you, you got to have your story down not like uh, a play rehearsal but you better practice it to be able to tell a story because if you can't talk about yourself which is hard to do um, if you stop after about two minutes, there's not a lot left to talk about. So you, you need to be able to have your, not necessarily elevator pitch, um, but something that you can practice your story um, and it comes natural. And, you know, I decided to go to Syracuse University after I went to, I don't know, an, another school. This is why, you know, I have a story about that. What did I learn when I was doing this internship here? What did I like about that job? What did I thought it was going to be and it turned out to be something else? Um, have the story. If you don't have the story and it's not practiced at all, um, you'll see your first time practicing and it won't do well. And to touch on that, anything that is on your resume is fair game during that interview. So the question about how far back should you go with listing your experience, if it's on your resume but you don't remember what you did there or much about that experience, it's probably a sign that it'd be good to take it off. Because they might say, oh, I see 10 years ago you volunteered here. Tell me about that. Just, you know, as a question that they might come up with. So. And be prepared for anything. I know we're getting off resumes and into interviews a little bit, but be prepared for anything. Because you've got four people up here who have all interviewed probably hundreds and in some cases thousands of people. And I bet we all have a little bit different interview style. So be prepared for that. You also get a lot of interviewers out there that are very inexperienced. They haven't done it a lot, so they make a lot of mistakes. It's to your advantage because then you can tell your story. 
That's why Andy's idea of practicing is a good idea. Yeah, your resume gets you in the door, and then it's up to you to kind of make that connection with the person that you're interviewing with. Yeah. Um, so you want to find some kind of a personal connection with that person. And there's a little bit of a, I guess, you know, an art to that, and being able to find that common ground. Because, you know, Andy's right, yes. you deal with very different personalities, and a lot of it comes down to you know, trying to find a common ground, common interests, common background, whether you're at the same school. Anything that, that can kind of set you apart. With that one, that person's looking back later, comparing you with other candidates. They kind of remember something specific about you that stands out. Do you have tips for including in your cover letter specific things for the job you're looking for without just rehashing what you have on your resume? Yeah, definitely don't rehash your resume. Um, because of the only guy just for yeah. <laughs> Take the job, the ad that you've applied for. There's, there's always an ad, whether it's online or on paper or uh, comes out verbally. Somebody's going to ask for qualities A, B, C, D. The very best way that I like to see that shows me that the person who wrote that cover letter has thought about it is if I'm asking for um, Java or C++ or I'm asking for these particular things, I want you to tell me in your cover letter how you've got that. Make a short statement about it. If I'm asking for somebody that has um, proven leadership skills, this goes back to your question about leadership. In my cover letter, I am going to talk a little bit about how I've got these leadership skills without rehashing what's already on the resume. It's more of a verbal story. And everybody's different, too. I think, uh, you know, as a recruiter, I rarely even look at a cover letter because, you know, it, it comes down to it. A company is paying me a certain amount of money to, to be able to find their candidates, and if I can't see and make a case for it based on your resume, it's going to be very hard for me to convince that person to interview you and uh, you know, based upon you know, some kind of connection. That can be different, very different, I think. It is different. It is I look at cover different. letters. And the reason I look at cover letters is I want to know how much effort you put into it. And, and I think it might have been Andy or Brian that said sometimes we've got cover letters that have got the wrong company name on it or the wrong job title on it. That really shows me that you didn't take any time to I've seen that Fly. not happen as much as it used to. I think people used to do, uh, used to do a mail merge and yeah. they print off, you know, 50 resumes to 50 companies. Yeah, I and still mail see it though. Yeah. I still see that. But I don't, I don't get the uh, as many unsolicited yeah. resumes. I think the other thing you want to do in a cover letter versus the resume is the resume is quick, quantifiable pieces of information about what you've done. When you have the opportunity in the cover letter to pick out a few things, you want to show those examples um, and tell a little bit more about it than what's just on the resume. So you might start with, you know, I have experience with Java, but you go into a little bit more of that detail, that qualitative type story of using that in the cover letter. And I think sometimes, too, you've got another small story to tell in your cover letter. And I'll give you a real recent example. I had a young man from out in Chicago. He got in touch with me. I saw him post something on LinkedIn that he was a recent graduate and he wanted to move back to Syracuse. And, and I thought I'd step forward as I do so every so often and help him out and offer to speak with him because he wanted to work in, uni in a university. And I do business with several of them in the area. So he and I had a phone conversation and we talked a little bit about it. And what we decided was going to work for him in his cover letter is to make a statement as to why he's living in Chicago and wants to move to Syracuse to work. So he covered that in a brief couple of sentences. You know, that this is why. You, know, you see I'm from Chicago. I'm willing to relocate myself to Syracuse, New York. So again, here we go. We keep saying it depends. It's got to be personalized towards your situation. And towards the position and company that you're applying to. Right. And one quick thing, too, with cover letters. I had wrote this down, and then I realized it more happened in cover letters, and our focus was on resumes. But since we're here, um, one of the things that I noticed as a recruiter, and I don't get it periodically working in career services, but a little bit, is pointing out to the recruiter, I know you're looking for three years of experience, and I don't have that, but I have two internships. You never want to point out you know, anything that you don't have. Always speak to your positives. Always speak to how you can contribute to the company and help out you know, these individuals that are recruiting at different companies. It's never what the company can do for you, either. There's a couple more questions in here. Do you remember yours? Yeah. Um, hi. Okay. Uh, right now, uh, this is like my first semester now. So, uh, I was thinking I get my resume, you know, uh, overhaul right now. 
I'm sure a lot of things that I already have in my resume would, would probably be redundant in about a year from now. So I need to know what I should be taking off or what I should be keeping in, uh, because I come from India. So some of the work experiences there might not really hold water here, right? So and then some of the things which which has led me to global exposure, probably those things I can keep. So I need, I need to know what are the things that I can keep, and those things which I'm keeping here, in what way can I project them? I, I think I would probably disagree with you if I'm understanding you correctly, that experiences that you had in India are irrelevant completely, even if it's just focused in India. I don't think that's probably the case, um, because it's still showing skills, still showing that you've had internships or work experience, um, so you don't need to take those off um, the resume. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about the American style resumes, um, making sure you're including courses that you're currently taking, you're, you've updated the resume with any experiences you've had over the summer. I think that's a lot of what we also see in career services is making sure you know we've got to add in any involvement on campus or things that you're doing, any part-time jobs even that you've held, any experiences here in the United States if you're looking for a job after um, you graduate in the U.S. shows that experience in our type of culture as well. So I don't think it's necessarily taking it off unless you're getting to that point where you're approaching maybe a, a very lengthy resume. What's, what is what field are you in? Uh, engineering management with my concentration in supply chain. Okay. And what was your experience in India? Uh, supply chain. So. Okay. So absolutely keep it absolutely. keep it on there. And you know, it's again the same thing when you're applying to, to new positions, you want to try to find a way to relate that. So make sure the vocabulary is the same as much as possible and uh, create those ties, but absolutely that experience is still very relevant. Okay. Thanks. There's another question. Yeah. What if you want to have a job with the different requirements, but our major is different, but I am more passionate and indulge in job and I am a little bit happy doing in that thing and artistic. What we should put this in the middle? Great. Let me just clarify, make sure we understand you. So what if you're going to school for one thing, but then you have something else you're passionate about that you want to get a job yeah. in? Like I want to go something like automobile industry. I want to design a car, but my concentration uh, is from civil engineering or something like that. Can I do that for? What should we put if I'm not passionate about it? I would say you need to go back to school for that particular thing. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, skills aren't the skills aren't there, even though you you know you've got it in another arena. I mean, it could help you get into another school that you know more in line with that because it's it's, it's kind a of hard like, thing to do yeah. especially with a technical field like that it's a hard thing to do but I think if I were looking at it I would try to look for evidence of, of how do you show that you're very interested in uh, manufacturing or you know, what, what ways can you uh, demonstrate that you've taken an interest in you know, their clubs or their um, certifications I don't know uh, but I would look for that and then also I think those technical skills you would need to be able to build to those up. And I think it depends on what aspect of automobile manufacturing. As we know, automobiles are all computers these days. There's no such thing as a carburetor unless you own a class of car. So if you've got a lot of technical skills in the computer area, then you could try to show how you could apply that, do your research, and, and find out what goes on in these computers in the cars. And apply what you've got to how it can help the automobile. Can we include my web profile in our resume, for example, like our LinkedIn profile? I would say uh, definitely, and if you're going to go even further down the social networking thing, if you're going to put it, if you're going to put your Twitter feed on your resume, don't do stupid stuff on Twitter. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then, keep it professional, or don't keep it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, Things like to LinkedIn. If you've got a web, are you saying you have a web page for just yourself? Uh, yeah, like yeah. LinkedIn. Like yeah, LinkedIn, okay, absolutely. Yeah. And, I, and I know a lot of um, people with creatives have their portfolio online. Just, you have to, because it's easier. 
Um, but, you know, I've even told some of the students that, you know, even if you're not, you don't have artwork to show, you could have your own profile out there with writing samples or some of the work that you've done. Um, you know, an HR person could do that as well. Here's, here's who I am. Um, I think LinkedIn kind of discovered that, but, you know, you could create your, if you wanted to be creative, you could, if you're good enough to create like an infograph, those are so popular today, to make an infograph on yourself. Um, I've looked at that, I don't know how easy it is. <laughs> Um, but there probably is some sort of website or app out there that um, might even take some of your skills that are listed on your resume. It's kind of a you know a different a different approach. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, so maybe you guys can be the first. One of the things I'll say about the LinkedIn is don't replace a resume with LinkedIn. I'm a huge LinkedIn fan. I use it for recruiting. I use it a lot. But one of the things I don't like, and I mentioned what you guys all have to say, is when somebody will send me a cover letter and say, please refer to my LinkedIn profile, and they don't attach a resume. I am not going to take the time. So know they're going to get you in the no pile. I'm not going to take the time to go to your LinkedIn account and copy-paste so I can present that information to my client. And I bet you got you wouldn't do the same. No. There may come a time that it replaces it, or it, right. it, it but it's not there yet. be able to do that, but it's yeah, not, it's there, not yet. there yet. It's a good point, though, you know, to your question about adding it. I'm, I'll probably look for you anyway. Um, so if you put a link there, it's just, it just saves me the step of you know, Googling you. So. Since we're on LinkedIn, I have a couple quick questions. Um, do you necessarily have to have a profile picture on LinkedIn? Or do you really look for that? Or if you see it not there, you think the person hasn't taken the time to really fill out that LinkedIn? I don't place? care. I'm 50-50 um, on it. I'm, I'm next. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, you know, I could see why you would have different opinions. I prefer to have to see one. To me, I mean, and I think LinkedIn gets on a little, get down that slippery slope of, you know, the reason you you don't have pictures on your resume is because of the discrimination yeah. aspect. And I think that's something that LinkedIn kind of walked that line with. But but for me, I, I view LinkedIn as is more than just a resume, and it's it's kind of a better chance for me to know you as a candidate. Um, so for me, I always prefer to see one, but I can see why people need to And make it professional. professional. If you do have one, not on the beach, shirtless, please. <laughs> or you're, you're semi-formal with, you know. Yeah, somebody chopped off. Yeah. <laughs> also, I'm like, yeah, how much should just be a rehashing of your resume? Like, should you have all that information on there and then some more, or should it not be a rehash? It needs to match. Whatever it is, it needs to match. Um, I like to see everything on the LinkedIn profile that's on the resume and vice versa, maybe even more on LinkedIn because it tells a bigger story. And the reason I like to see that is I want to gather as much information. One of the first things I do is look at LinkedIn. That's how I find people. I truly do headhunt. And what that really means is that I go out there on LinkedIn. Nobody's applied, they're already working somewhere, and I find them and I go after them to, to present to my clients. So the more information that's out there on LinkedIn, the better it is for people like me. Um, just to go back to your photo question, um, I didn't get a chance to jump in. Um, the last yeah, I heard, we're also shy. <laughs> the last I heard statistic-wise was that your profile is seven times more likely to be viewed if you have a photo with it. So someone that is looking and recruiting and using LinkedIn as a tool, that is something helpful. I believe there is a Just for Masters series on LinkedIn coming up in a few weeks too. So make sure you sign up for that. Look. Um, yes. And then the other thing, thank you, I is do have, um, I do have these that you can take with you. The rest of the schedule is on here. So the other thing that's sneaky about LinkedIn is I believe you have to have 100% profile complete, like completeness. Um, in order to see extra features sometimes, I always say LinkedIn's like a video game. You complete this certain level and they unlock achievements for you. So the last thing I knew about LinkedIn was the more complete your profile is by adding in all of these pictures and suggestions in the summary section and asking for recommendations, the more you'll see when you are looking for those alumni connections in certain areas in your search results. Um, that being said, the other thing that's neat about LinkedIn is we're encouraging you resume-wise to be concise, and you should be concise in your LinkedIn profile, but that is a way where there's really not a limit. Sometimes professionals that have 30 or 40 years of experience, you can scroll a very long time on your LinkedIn profile. So there is that opportunity to add a little bit of additional information as needed. Um, 
And my last point about LinkedIn is it can be very difficult if, if any of you are still, you know, you're focused in your master's degree program, but, but there might be a few different directions you could take. LinkedIn can be tough because you want to be specific without being so locked into one category. Um, when I worked as a recruiter, um, we, I was looking for an IT project manager for a client. Well, the client Googled the candidate I had sent over, and the candidate had a communications degree. It wasn't IT specific, but she had put on her LinkedIn profile that she was looking to start a master's degree in museum studies within two years. The client got back to me and said, oh, I just looked her up on LinkedIn, and I noticed that she, did she mention this to you? I said, no, she didn't mention that. I look on her profile, there it is. He doesn't want to interview her anymore. So you need to be specific enough in showcasing what you're going toward next without being, you know, if, you're, if you've changed your mind, you need to change your, your profile. So you have to constantly keep that updated as your, your focus you changes. Accurate, correct, absolutely. There's been a question up here. So. Okay. <laughs> How much do you guys look at other social media websites? If you give it to me, I'll look. Um, otherwise, Generally speaking, I don't have time to look, look up somebody's Facebook. Um, I mean, I just don't. A lot of people do, though. Yeah. A lot do. I hear a lot of fellow HR people that, that do that. Yeah, I think it does vary by the person, but it depends how much time I have that day. And how nosy right. I'm feeling. <laughs> <laughs> how unusual of a name you have. I don't know if you're Joe Smith, you know, who's going to take the time to scroll through all those Joe Smiths. <laughs> That being said, you should Google yourselves weekly, yes. set up Google Alerts for yourself, right. see what's being showcased out there. The Google Alerts is a great Absolutely. And I'll channel somebody else who works with your services. Me or Kim? Kim. Yeah. Uh, when you send a connection for LinkedIn, you can send, them, um, send a, a personal yes. note in there. Good Just idea. say, I'm going to be a master student. I'm trying to build up my network. Uh, you work in the industry. I, I would really like it if you would connect with me. Thank you very much. Short and sweet, but to get the, I get the generic ones every day. Please connect with me. I'm just like, all right, who are you? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. You were at the internship fair last week. I'll probably do it, but if it's uh, a blind one, you know, if you guys linked in with me here, I, I would be fine with that. And just say, hey, you're on the panel discussion, discussion panel. Yeah. Cool. Um, what are your opinions on unique things about a person on a resume that aren't related to the job description? Everybody hear that? So Jay, yeah. can you give us an example? Sure. So um, like if you studied abroad in a unique place Um, I think you build that into your story. You talk about yourself uh, in your resume. Um, I had, I was an intern of ours. She was a, a mobile skier and was set to go to the Olympics. I don't know what year, but um, she blew out her knee. And, but she got to carry the torch uh, through her hometown. And she had that on there. And it was an interesting story. You tell a little insight. And, you know, basically she, she was able to tell the story of, training her whole life to do this, and then, yeah, going to college, but all of a sudden, college became much more important to her because, you know, she wasn't going down that path, she wasn't going to the Olympics. And it was always like slant it professionally <laughs> towards the job. You can always find the slant that, that your story is a perfect one because what that shows is determination and reliability. Anybody who can train through the Olympics is going to show up for work. So that's <laughs> <laughs> and I still remember her name. Did she get the job? Uh, she got the internship with us, and then uh, she's working in New York at, at a marketing firm. Take a couple more questions, and then we'll wrap it up. Other panelists will hang around and answer your questions, but I'll just take a few more if we have them. Oh. What part of the is what should be put on about basically perfect when you 
far right. We should we discuss our qualities like in low level or something like we should have dedicated to your work or something different. It was hard to hear you. Um, it's about what to put in a cover letter, yeah. uh, like your skills or yeah. or more about the job. Yeah. I think you want to put in the cover letter what they're asking for. Qualifications. How do your skills relate to the qualifications they're asking for? And then you have to ask yourself, do my skills match the qualifications right. they're looking Good for? Point. And if they don't, um, I've heard people, I'm just sending it in anyway, so I might something else. Please don't. You're not going to be looked at. Um, I'm not going to be like, ooh. I'm not going to remember that you applied to this job in six months when I have the opening that matches your skill sets. I'm just not going to remember. And why do you want to do this job for this company? Again, showing that match of why, you know, there's all these different companies to apply to. What is it about this company and this position that you can, can do and show them why you're interested? Yeah, I mean, essentially, why are you interested in the job and what makes you a fit in your opinion? Very concise. And I think one of the things, I'll be interested in your guys' opinion on this. I do this as a consultant because I have to go out and prospect for business, so I'm applying for jobs every single day, basically, just in a different format. And if I have an organization that I have a personal interest in, for example, I'm a car fanatic, I'm a classic car buff. And when, that's why I like your car auto question, and I, I've gotten clients before by letting them know that. I've gotten automobile dealerships, I've gotten paint shops, I've gotten repair centers because I let them know I have a personal interest in this. Use that carefully and use it wisely because sometimes if you're lacking in some of the skills that there's the passion that we've all talked about that you have a passion for. Here's another question again. Yeah, I think it is new. Writing a resume for an internship, would that be any different? I mean, you're probably going to show more of the coursework. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I mean, if you're going to list the coursework, you may want to, if there's, just do a handful of coursework and, you know, maybe some bullets underneath as to what you got out of that, the coursework. Because um, for me to see Econ 203, you know, macroeconomics is a lot of difficult for me. You know, what did you learn in there specifically that might help, depending on what the internship is for? Right. Absolutely. to use one line for the coursework. I guess the question was how much space, or it takes up too much space on the resume. Was that your question? Yes. Okay, so when you're listing your coursework, we have an example. Um, I'm hoping I haven't had a chance to look at the new career guides yet. Um, but no coursework. No. So usually what you would do is include it in your education section. Um, you can put it right below where your GPA might be listed, or if you're in your first semester, you don't have a GPA yet. So underneath the degree, and you can list your related courses. Now, if you've got other things that go on the resume, maybe you just list out four or five of the course names. And it just takes one line to do that right across the page from left to right. That makes sense? Was there one more question? Well, if everyone would uh, join me in thanking the employers for